Hello, I'm Nadine DeRaza and welcome to the Simply Business Show, a program devoted to making business and economics simple and easy to understand. And coming up in today's show, we'll explore the impact of business in sport by looking at the extent of the influence that business has on some major global sporting events and the benefit that you, the viewing public, receive with a spotlight, of course, on the Olympics, which are just around the corner. We'll also put the focus on an international leading figure in our People Profile feature. And later on, we'll unravel the effects of currency fluctuations and the significance that they have on businesses, national economies and travellers across the world. But first of all, it's business in sport. On the 27th of July 2012, the eyes of the world will be on London as it hosts the 30th Olympic Games and performs the much-anticipated opening ceremony. Now, businesses across the world invest huge amounts to be associated with the Games and expect a measurable return on investment, whether that's brand recognition, new business, customer loyalty or generating new leads. So in July and August, alongside the hallowed Olympic Five Rings, the specially designed and widely used 2012 logo will feature heavily. So all those businesses that have sponsored the Games and use the 2012 insignia will start to benefit from their investment. Or will they? I'm going to show you some logos. OK. And I want to see if you can guess what they're about. So if I show you this logo, can yeah. you guess what that is? To 2012 Olympic Games. That's the Olympic one, I guess. The official one. You're yeah. spot on. Now, this is a company sponsoring the Olympic Games. They've paid a lot of money. Who could it be? Blue and white. Is it a Banks? Uh, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> An airline? An airline? Don't tell me it's BA. Yes. Oh, gosh. Who do you think the company is behind this one? Um, Any ideas? No. Now, how about this one? So, not much difference, just the colours are slightly different. Any idea? Do you know? No idea. Who do you think? Go on. No, no, Name no. a company. Pepsi. Logo. Coke. Coke. McDonald's. 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 I didn't think. <laughs> I can see why they want to sponsor it, but the problem is it's not very visible from the logo I've just seen. Corporate people might earn the money, the corporate people will see the events, and most of the ordinary people have not had the opportunity to get tickets. And the best and thing I would like to see is the people on the ground level, those that don't make it anywhere, put them in the forefront, let them go home with something to say, this was in my country and I made some money from it. Yeah. Not just the top brass, right at the top. Yeah. You want to see the very, very low at the, the bottom. Grassroots, the, the grassroots, the local people. people the yeah. grassroots people. Well, I'm now joined by Chief Executive and Sponsorship Specialist Andy Westlake, whose company Fast Track broker some of the highest value sponsorship deals in sport. And I know Fast Track have many business interests in the Olympics, as well as other major sporting events. Andy, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Well, we've just seen some footage of people pretty much recognising the Olympic logo, but when it came down to individual brands of companies, many of the people interviewed really struggled to know who they represented. Mm. So have these companies and brands wasted their money? No, I don't think they have. I mean, I think there are three things to recognise here. One is that there are some international sponsors who are coming off the back of the Vancouver Games, and so they have a two-year window, a very specific window, to get their London message out. Also, some of those brands aren't looking for awareness, so it's important to recognise that there are a whole range of things that sponsors are trying to achieve. Um, thirdly, it's like any good athletics race. It's a race to the line, and the line is in the summer next year, so they're getting their campaigns ready to really hit the, re hit the ground running in 2012, and so I think the awareness will rise and rise as we go through 2012. So some value, obviously, will be achieved later as well, but, Andy, how does it actually get measured? How can you measure that return on investment? And have you seen an example where sponsorship of a huge sporting event actually helped a brand or a community? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's... It, it's one of, the, one of the things the industry has agonised with over the years. How do we have a standard methodology for measuring the return of sponsorship? And actually, there isn't one. What you have to recognise is a very versatile medium. And you have to be very clear before you go into it what it's trying to achieve. And you set up some specific measures 
to tell you whether you're achieving those things or not. So if it's about awareness, then you track awareness. If it's about sales, you track sales. If it's about reputation, you track reputation. So it's about building a dashboard of measures that tell you whether your sponsorship's successful or not successful. Well, there's definitely some scepticism about business and sport being involved together. So why do companies invest money into sport and where does their money go? Well, the, the money goes to the federations, to the organisations that are responsible for running the sports events. Why do brands get into sport? I think increasingly because the world of communications is becoming increasing, increasingly fragmented. Um, brands are looking for opportunities to connect properly with consumers, to connect at a deeper and more meaningful level and actually our view is that sport is one of those things that the world's population care about. You take the, the, the FIFA World Cup, the Football World Cup, the whole world cares about their team competing in the FIFA World Cup. And so if as a sponsor you can add value to those consumers' passions for, the, for football, then you, you're in a great position to influence, engage with, um, and hopefully get those brands to buy your product more regularly. So I think brands are seeing sport as a real big opportunity to do that. And I think in London, with 2012 on the horizon, it's been one of those topics that every boardroom table has been talking about over the last five years since we won the bid. But how does it filter down to those grassroots level? That's my concern as well. We talk about lottery funding goes to good causes, but rarely do we see training facilities accredited to commercial sponsorship. So where's that grassroots yeah, area? Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, £2.2 billion pounds in London of national lottery funding is going to the Olympic Park in East London, and a whole lot of lottery funding is going into the athletes themselves. I think increasingly the sponsors of sport are thinking about how they also develop grassroots programmes around their programmes. Around their, uh, around their sponsorships. Um, you know, I take, take some examples like HSBC and the British and Irish Lions, the rugby tour in South Africa two years ago. They spent an awful lot of money on a big grassroots programme to invest money into rugby facilities in South Africa and in the UK. So I think it's part of the storytelling now for major sponsors to invest in grassroots as well as the top of the pyramid because I, f I think they feel like they have to do the, the whole job rather than part of the job. OK, I get it. Sponsorship of sport is here to stay from grassroots right up to that top level of sponsorship athletes but why is sponsorship actually increasing the amount of money it's investing at the moment expected to grow by what five percent mm -hmm. and that's against a backdrop when the worldwide economy is really suffering certainly mm -hmm. in certain mm -hmm. countries especially the eurozone it comes back to that that um, that uh, reason I told you about earlier which is as the world of communications becomes more fragmented I think brands are looking for really big opportunities to connect with audi audiences at, at a more meaningful level and sport seems to be one of those things that more and more people are gathering around so the Super Bowl in the US last year it's been an event that's got a great long history in 2011 the Super Bowl had its highest ever TV audience in US history so it says to me that whilst there's this massive fragmentation going on around the world more and more people are focusing their efforts and their energies and their passions around sport and so that's a great opportunity for big commercial brands. Well Andy Westlake thank you very much for your time and we wish you all the best particularly with the imminent Olympic Games. Thank you very much for joining us thank today. Thank you very much. Before I'm joined by my next guest Olympic gold medalist and one half of the lightweight rowing doubles champions Zach Purchase MBE let's remind ourselves about the moment Zach crossed the winning line in Beijing in 2008. And it is the British partnership of Zach Purchase, Mark Hunter in the stroke seat. They are being caught. The advantage is being whittled away, but the line is coming. It was a length, it's now half a length, but it's gold for Great Britain, silver for Greece, and bronze to Denmark. And so a first ever Olympic lightweight goal for Great Britain, courtesy of Zach Purchase and Mark Hunter. Well, Zach, welcome to the Simply Business Show. Thank you very much for joining us. And watching that footage again, I still get worried that you're not actually going to get gold every time I watch it. But what an amazing moment. Must live with you forever. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, crossing that finish line in Beijing was, was such an emotional rush. Um, I mean, we put six years of, of pretty hard work into six minutes. Um, a year a minute sounds like quite a lot of sacrifice. But at the end of the day... Um, winning gold medals is, is what it's all about and that's what made it worthwhile. Congratulations to you. Well our last guest Andy Westlake talked about the sponsorship landscape. From your perspective Zach, how important is sponsorship to you as an athlete? Well I think the, what, the, the most important thing to, to recognise is that there is a direct cor correlation uh, between the amount of funding in a sport and its success. 
Uh, rowing is luckily one of the most uh, successfully funded sports uh, in the UK at the moment, and also it's one of the most successful. Um, we wouldn't be able to produce the results we do without the amount of funding from our sponsors, um, from the lottery and from, from Siemens, our high-performance sponsor. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, that has to come down to the athletes as well. You know, we, we are funded by the lottery and we have our own personal sponsors, and that enables us to train pretty much 24-7. Okay, in sports such as football, I mean, I'm wondering sometimes whether you wish you were a football player. I know you're a very good cyclist, but you get some amazing sponsorship deals as well. Is it lucrative from your point of view, or as an individual, are you restricted in terms of what you can and can't do by the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, or rowing's governing body? Oh, well, to be honest with you, the, the first and foremost thing to remember is that most of us athletes are more focused on, on the winning side of things and the performance side of things. Um, yes, it's all, it's all well and good having, having that funding there and having the sponsorship, but if you don't win, then no one's going to be interested in it anyway. Um, we, are, we do have opportunities to explore uh, sponsorship opportunities. Um, I'm sponsored currently by BMW, Oakley and British Airways as my three title sponsors. Um, but there are a lot of other rights which are signed away to people like the IOC. Um, and to British rowing, which, which we do give them, admittedly, a little bit begrudgingly occasionally, but uh, you know, it's important for them to be able to sell us athletes to, to bring in sponsorship to be able to run events like the Olympic Games and the World Championships. Well, generally speaking, do sponsors expect a lot from their athletes in return for their support, or do you think the balance is right, those three sponsors that you've mentioned, do they get it right for you, Zach? Absolutely, yeah. They're, they're a fantastic group of people to work with. Um, I was just uh, the last weekend at BMW's Christmas uh, Christmas dinner, and you know they're a really fantastic bunch of people to work with, and they're really keen to not just to be involved in the sport and to sponsoring me, but just to sort of understand what it's all about and sort of get a glimpse into the life of being an Olympic athlete. And of course, British Airways being one of the uh, airline suppliers for for the London Games, they they have a very clear picture of of what athletes need to do in order to perform. And they're, they're very willing to, to say, yeah, we understand that you need to do some training. Um, you go and train and we'll talk to you when, when you've got time. So everyone's very, very accepting of the fact that performance has to come first. And Zach, before we say goodbye to you, can we see that gold medal, please, that you won so gallantly in Beijing? Please hold it up for us. This one here. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, we wish you all the best. Thank you very much for coming in today and good luck for London 2012. <laughs>
It's now time to reveal why the prices of everyday commodities are affected by currency fluctuation rates, the impact that different currencies can have on business, and we'll also look at ways that currency values can change consumer behaviour quite dramatically. But before we address the macro effects of currency exchange rates, I thought I'd go and see what effects currency fluctuations have on that great British institution, the good old English Fry Up. Oh, thank you very much. That looks lovely. Thank you. Well, I'm here in central London at Henry's Restaurant, and I've got a traditional English breakfast. Now, this time last year, this breakfast was a lot cheaper. So when I look at the plates that I've got here, why is that? The eggs, sausages, potatoes, the tomato and the bacon, well, they've gone up in price, but that's really down to inflation and maybe supply and demand. But it's really coffee that has increased in price. So much so that this time last year, thank you, this cup of coffee would have been 25% less in terms of raw material composite prices. And it's not only because of supply and demand and inflation, it's currency that's had an impact on the price of my coffee. I'm now joined by leading business economist, Professor Dominic Swords, and director of foreign exchange for the foremost currency group, Adam Bobroff, to discuss this further. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me here on the Simply Business Show. Dominic, if I can start with you, mm. before we actually look into why currency exchange rates are so important to everybody, let's take a look at the composite price of the great British breakfast. Mm. And there are some anomalies, aren't there? On the one hand, we expect prices to rise, but in our example, the cost of eggs has actually fallen, but the price of coffee has risen by yeah. over 25%. Yes. Why is that? Well, as, you, as you were saying, some part of that is uh, sort of relative supply and demand, and I think that there's a lot of competition in, in the dairy market, uh, and f farmers are finding ways of finding cheaper ways of producing eggs. Coffee is a particular problem. Not only is there an increasing demand globally for coffee, and there are sometimes problems with harvests, but the market for coffee is denominated in dollars. You have to pay for coffee in dollars. And at a time where the, the US dollar is appreciating, that makes it much more expensive to buy that, that product. So there's a, a very important overlay of the foreign currency element in the price, as well as basic supply and demand. So you're saying it's the US dollar at the moment is having an impact on that price of coffee because it's traded in dollars. Indeed, that is part of the, that is part of the problem. Got it. Um, Adam, I know you make a living understanding and trading in some, I think, 27 currencies each week. That's right. So in a nutshell, can you explain why we should be interested in currency fluctuations and how do they touch all our lives? Yeah, I mean, obviously they're, they're, they're very relevant to, as you said, with the coffee example, as to the actual costs that we're, we're paying for the goods and therefore what drives inflation for the country as well. So um, as the pound remains very weak against and the majority of currencies, not least of all the US dollar, of course, in the coffee example. Um, of course, it's therefore driving up the goods that we're importing in. And for a country like the UK, really, because we do import such a high number of goods, um, and we don't manufacture perhaps as much as would be nice, um, of course, therefore, that's driving prices, prices up and up and up. So it's therefore relevant to everything that we feel on a day-to-day -day basis, including petrol. You know, fuel is a prime example and a, and a key driver to, to inflation at the moment as well. Currency fluctuations can actually change consumer behaviour mm. quite dramatically, as I alluded to at the top of the piece. Can you explain exactly how that's happening? Well, I think there are, there are a number of uh, directions in which that changes consumer behaviour. It's interesting to notice that not very long ago, it was it, from Europe, it was a good place to go to the Far East to be able to buy... Um, relatively inexpensive uh, luxury products and we're discovering the opposite is the case now over over the course of uh, 2011 when you've seen the UN um, appreciate quite considerably uh, against the euro you're now discovering that it's actually very um, cost effective to buy luxury goods in Paris and in London and a lot of Chinese consumers are finding yeah, with a 10% appreciation if you're buying a five five and a half thousand dollar um, uh, Hermes bag yeah, you could say $500 by buying it in the UK or buying it in Paris. So, Adam, on the back of that, where's mm. the next trend for buying luxury goods? Where do you think it's likely to emerge? What's going to be the key driving mm. force? I think, uh, well, the UK is obviously benefiting off the back of that. We've got busloads of people coming over from China to buy, to buy our goods, which is good for, for us as an economy. Um, it always used to be the US, you know, the famous shopping trip to New York where you'd go and buy your goods on the cheap. Um, I think that will probably resume as a trend actually anyway. 
Um, I think that the US has probably still got a fair bit of bad news to, to come out and therefore for the markets to move back up where it makes it more attractive to go shopping in places like New York. Well, we'll get some more information about currencies in just a moment. But earlier on, I went onto the streets of London to get some views, opinions and perceptions of how currency fluctuations are affecting visitors from overseas and also the views of some Brits thinking of going abroad. And this is what they had to say. I look at currency prices every day because I think to myself, um, shall I go on holiday? I'm retired now. Shall I go on holiday next week? Or if it has a bit of a slump, I think, uh, or I'll leave it for a few weeks and see how it goes. My spending power isn't as, uh, as good as it used to be. But uh, no, I still travel quite a lot. I think it's just a good time to travel at the moment for Australians because the Australian dollar is so high. Well, I went to Australia at the beginning of the year, and that's um, significantly higher than it used to be. So comparatively, um, not as high as some of the other territories. But yeah, it's, it's, it's getting harder. The first time I came to London, it was much lot cheaper than now. You're not getting much well rent, definitely. Um, I looked at the currency. I was a little worried because I obviously can't do as much here since my dollar doesn't go as far. But I just love London, so I had to come anyways. <laughs> So we've got some mixed views there, haven't you? And it's relative. It depends on where you live. Mm. An Australian example, mm. great for travelling, whereas others have found it you know, a little bit more expensive. Mm. However, it hasn't prevented everybody from not travelling, currency fluctuations, although we haven't interviewed the people that haven't come here because of the price By of currency. By definition, they're not here. They're not here, <laughs> indeed. Um, and I can't avoid the issue of the euro, and there are many comments that potentially there may be a two-speed, a two-tier euro, mm. Europe in place, Dominic. Mm. Yeah. Or potentially the euro unravelling completely, mm. which sounds pretty catastrophic. Yeah. What's your take on this at the moment? Yeah. Um, I mean, the take is that there's just so much uncertainty um, over the short, medium term. And big changes happen in economies. We know that big changes happen. And the context that, uh, that's, that, that, that is there for the euro is that globally there are enormous changes in terms of the, the patterns of trade, the patterns of investment, the, the pattern of people traveling around the world. And within that context, you know, there, there is a question mark about the future role of the euro uh, within the global economy and, as you say, what the, the eurozone looks like. Um, one scenario is that the euro could could break up and we could go back into separate countries within Europe. I think a much more likely scenario is that you, we like to see a trimming of the number of countries within the eurozone, but that that will continue as a strong trade in currency. And what kind of impact would that have globally, an upheaval of something like the euro? What's that going to do to the global scene? Well, in a sense, it, it partly drives the global scene, but in a way it's kind of reflecting what's going on. Because if you look at other parts of the world, if you look at the, the Pacific region, uh, of, of, the, of the globe, look at the Asian economies, rather than being dependent so much on exporting around to the, uh, the, the North Atlantic Rim countries, there's a lot more trade going on within that region. So in a sense, part of the Eurozone's problem is a reflection of that shift in trade. But surely, um, if the Eurozone, if Europe generally goes through a period of, of slow growth, that has a really negative impact on exports from places like uh, from Vietnam, from India, from China, and a whole group of countries in that region. And we saw at the top of the piece meeting breakfast. It was mm. delicious, by the way. Dominic, finally, where in the world do you envisage will be the most economically attractive place for holidaymakers to buy breakfast, say, in the next year or two? Well, it would be an interesting piece of research to create uh, an index of breakfast around the world. Should we do it? I think that would be a good idea. The Big um, Mac Index. It's a competitor <laughs> to the Big Mac Index. Um, well, I, I think surely we're beginning to see a lot of growth stabilising and the, the whole picture around the Asia-Pacific really blossoming, really coming into um, you know, a very strong growth phase. Latin America as well, uh, countries like Brazil, I think will be likewise interesting places to have a good breakfast and if you go to Brazil then fantastic coffee along with it. Dominic, Adam, thank you very much for coming in to demystify the issues around currency fluctuations. So exchange rates can affect retail prices and eat into our hard-earned cash. But for business, it's an important part of the overall pricing mechanism and often contributes a huge amount to companies' balance sheets. But for all of that, there are always winners and losers in every currency fluctuation. At least now, we should know how to de-risk and make use of the upturns as and when they happen.
Well, it's now time for our glossary buster. And in this part of the show, we take a piece of industry jargon and burst it apart to identify its true meaning. And this week, our jargon buster is quantitative easing. There's no valid reason to call quantitative easing anything other than printing new money and pumping it into the system, except that you're not exactly pumping it into the system, but into corporate or government bonds usually. Now, when interest rates are low, there are fewer savers or investors. So the newly created bonds, which carry a more appealing interest rate, get sold through banks or insurance companies, effectively releasing new money into the system, which boosts the money supply. The theory goes that with more money in circulation, more consumers will buy products, which in turn will kickstart the economy and lead to economic growth. And over the last few years, the UK has implemented quantitative easing for the first time in its history to the tune of £257 billion. Pounds. Well, next time on the Simply Business Show, we'll look at the impact of business in fashion. We'll explore how some of the major labels determine next season's styles and look at what the consequences are for getting it wrong. We'll also take you behind the scenes of the London College of Fashion, where favourites such as Jimmy Choo and Linda Bennett from none other than LK Bennett learn their skills. And we'll also take a look at cloud computing and find out whether we can benefit from going to the cloud and save money in the process. I'm Nadine DeRaza and this has been the Simply Business Show. So until next time, thank you for watching and goodbye.